Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody back to our Lunch and Learn. And I hope everyone had good Yom Tovim, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and, and, and Sukkot, and uh, the last day, Shemini Yatzara, Simchas Torah. And now, Baruch Hashem, we're back to the beginning of the Torah, and the uh, opportunity to really explore together a fascinating uh, cycle of the episodes and the stories and, and the wisdom contained in, in the Book of Bracious, which many of the stories we're familiar with, and, and therefore I think it should be very exciting because we maybe know the, the basic outline and the structure, and we could fill in some of the wisdom and depth and details, and I, I think we'll, uh, it'll be something which will be a, a wonderful journey to, to share together. So I hope everybody is, uh, can utilize this opportunity this time on Tuesdays at 12 o'clock in New York time, and, uh, and just join, join us, dial into the Zoom conference call and uh, participate in the discussion and, or, and, um, and really achieve, help us achieve more than we could achieve by ourselves. You know, when there's dynamic interaction, it's, uh, it's a wonderful way to, to, to learn, and of course we all grow much more from it. If, you, if you're not able to dial in, you're also welcome to, to email me, rabbicraft at gmail.com, or, or, you know, or just send a, or send a, a text over. And uh, I'd be happy to include your questions in the discussion. So what I'd like to talk about today is, is a topic that interests me very much. And this has to do with the first test of Adam and Eve in the garden. And the first test which they're given obviously must symbolize to some extent the test that humanity will face throughout our course of history. And what was that first test? So just looking at the, the verses a little bit, it says, V'yikach Hashem Elohim Es Odom, and verse chapter 2, verse 14, verse 15, And Hashem Elohim took Odom, V'yani Cheu B'Gan Eden, and he placed him in a place with Gan Eden, the garden of Eden, the garden of pleasure, La'avdu L'Shamra, to work and to guard it. V'yitzav Hashem Elohim Ela Odom Leymar, and Hashem commanded Adam, saying, From every tree in the garden, eat you shall eat. But from the eight sadas, from the tree of the mixture of good and evil, don't eat from it. Because the day that you eat from it, most hamos, Die, you shall surely die. Let's just analyze this just verse for a moment and, and just, uh, just explore some concepts just right here. First of all, we see that the first commandment given to Adam, this is pre the creation of Eve, in the Garden of Eden is the commandment to be called Eitzagan Achotochel. You know, sometimes I like to ask this question when, when I'm teaching and I ask the question to many of my students and I say, what was the first commandment that God gave and everybody seems to jump and say, don't eat from the tree. However, when we read the verse, it doesn't say that. The first commandment in the Pasuk is, Echol tocha we call Eitzagad. Echol means eat. Tocha means you shall eat. The doubling of the verb makes it a command. The first command in the Garden of Eden was, Echol tocha was to eat to do, to enjoy the pleasures of this garden, which I think is extraordinarily important, the way Hashem wants us to approach this world. This world is a place that, that Hashem gives us for such pleasure and such opportunity for hadnah, as we say in Hebrew, enjoyment. And that's the first commandment. Whatever is available in this garden, I, I want you to experience it and to enjoy it. Of course, we understand that that Pleasure is only meaningful when one guides it and sometimes limits it and controls it. But Hashem's intention is that we should have the greatest pleasure in this world. That's commandment number one. Commandment number two is, das tovera From one tree, the tree of the Eitz Adas Tovera, a tree which is the knowledge of Tov, of good, and the knowledge of evil, don't eat from it. Now, interesting. 
How could there be a tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What does that mean? First of all, it's a very interesting concept that one thing God can't create is evil. God can only create tov. God can only create good. The word ra in Hebrew, in order to understand what it means, we translate it loosely as evil. But in its essence, the word ra means, well, I'll give us a word that we might be familiar with. You know, when we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, so we know we blow different sounds. We have the tekiya, which is that long sound. We have the shvarim, which is a mmm, mmm, mmm. And then we have a sound called the truah, which is ta 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 Truah. Do we hear the word ra in there? It's not the sound of evil. Truah. Ra in Hebrew, the Reish Ayin root, means disconnected. Those notes are all disconnected one from the other. And that's why it's called the true Ah, Ra. What's evil? Evil is disconnection from God. God doesn't create evil, only we can create evil. And the way we create evil is when we disconnect ourselves from our source. We disconnect ourselves from the word of, of Hashem. We disconnect ourselves from, from God Himself. So what happens? This tree is a Eitzadas Tovara, a tree that's going to mix together Tovara, if one eats from it. Pre-eating of the tree, one has clarity. There's God and there's good, and I know what to do. Apparently, once one eats from this tree, what happens is that clarity is lost, and now there's confusion in the world. And with that confusion, comes the opportunity of disconnection. And that's Ra. Evil is when we disconnect ourselves from God. God doesn't create it. The only beings that can create it are you and me. Are we? Us. But that's a function of eating from this tree. Why is that? So our sources tell us that apparently before eating of the tree, the Yetzirah, as it were, the Yetzirah we often loosely translate, as the evil inclination, but the correct translation is Yetzer is from the word Litzor, which means to create. Ra in Hebrew means disconnection. So it's a creative drive that enables disconnection. Now, we understand the Yetzirah is a function of the Satan that God places in our brain. It's there to test us in order to intensify our free choice so that any reward that we earn will truly be meaningful reward because we've truly fought something, we've earned it. But his job, so to speak, is just to create disconnection, is to create a, a illusions, making pleasures seem like they're more pleasurable than they really are, creating doubts in our mind as what to the right thing to do is, creating doubts in our mind of does God really demand from us. His job is just to create illusion so that we'll disconnect, so to speak, from God's word. That's the function of the Yetzirah. And when we achieve and we conquer it and we overcome, Hashem can reward us because it is indeed a fight, a fight that we're capable of winning. But apparently before eating from the tree, that Yetzirah, as it were, was outside of ourselves. It's only once we imbibed and Eve took it, she ate and offered to Adam and he ate. There was a change in the human being, whereby, is, whereby now the it's are internal, and with that comes a confusion, and now there's a blurring together of what's good and what's bad. That's the merging, that's the, the confusion, or the fusion, or the intermingling of good and bad. The das tovera, connection, das means connection, connection of good and evil. And it seems like I shall want to avoid that. Keep it separate from you. Keep it outside of you. Keep it in a place where you can manage it. Once the eight, there was a transformation whereby that confusion did overwhelm them. And it was an overpowering, so to speak, of, of desire and passion and, and all those forces that we have inside of us, but now sort of taken out of sync. No longer can the mind have that clarity to connect, but those forces, those, let's call them desires, powers of, of, of lusts and... and um, cravings, whatever it might be, which are all part of the human being and given in a place inside of us in order to, to utilize for holy purposes. Never do we say desire is evil. But when, it's, it's, when it overwhelms us 
and it confuses us. Now we have a different challenge. And the original plan was that should be separate, that should be outside, an overwhelming confusion. But by eating it, there came confusion. Now it's interesting, the Pasuk then ends and it says, Hashem says, from the eight adat, from this tree, the knowledge of which will mingle together the knowledge of good and evil, in other words, will mingle together your knowledge of what's good and you'll have confusion and therefore have the ability to disconnect because your, your passions perhaps will overwhelm you or there'll be confusion or illusions as to, to really what, how, how, how good things really are, or how pleasurable things really are. Lo tochol mimenu, don't eat from it. Ki biyom mimenu mos tamos. Because on the day that you eat from it, most die tamos, you will die. I saw a very beautiful comment from the, the Malbim, a, a wonderful uh, 19th century commentator from, uh, I believe, uh, from Poland, most tamos. And the Malbim offers and he says, why does it double the word? Die, you shall die. Because really, there's almost like a, a, this challenge now to fight, as it were, the, the desires of ourselves that, that, that come from having eaten from this tree, this, this overwhelming sense of my own importance and my, my, my pleasures and my lusts and my, my even keen and my jealousies. These, now that this is part of me, most tamos, it's going to be a continuous state, so to speak, of fighting those impulses. And when we give in to those impulses, on some level, there's a little bit of death in that. Because real life is when we're connected to Hashem, we're not confused. So now this confusion is going to be an element of most tamus, you surely will die. Not just a physical death, but a, a death in the sense that as we disconnect from Hashem in this world, there's an element of death in that. It's going to be a continuous process. process. Most die, tamus, you will die. Over and over again, this disconnection, this connection again from Hashem is, is really an element of death, as our sages say. That, that, that really, that is, as it says, with shoyim kamesim b'chayehim. The evil are like dead in their lives while they're alive. So we see that Hashem had a, had a wonderful plan and He really did not want us to eat from it. But that was the test. And Adam and Chava were placed in a situation where they would be tested. Apparently, had they passed that test, history could have progressed completely differently. History would have been finished. We could have entered into what we call the Gan Eden, the Kedem, the the eternal Gan Eden, and, and, and there wouldn't be part two in history, which is the world we know today, which is a correction, as it were, of the sin of, of Adam. But I'd like to focus a little bit now on the Nachash, the Nachash was loosely translated, was the snake, the serpent, whose job was to intensify the test. Again, there can't be a reward without a test. We know there has to be a test. If there isn't a test, then any reward that God gives isn't meaningful. As someone once said, you know, uh, you know soccer is a great game. Just remove the goalie. You'll be, you could score so many goals. You know, what's so hard about that? Oh, that's not a game. <laughs> the game is when you have the goalie trying to block you and you have three fullbacks getting in the way of the goalie, and you get around them, then you succeed, then you could cheer. Wow, I scored a goal. But without opposition, what's the, what's the value of success? And for spiritual gain, which, and the reward that God wants to offer us for eternity, there has to be a challenge as well. So one way in which Hashem wanted to intensify the challenge, so we should truly receive the reward that He wants to give, is he created a creature, or a being, or a creature, let's, let's use that word, called the Nachash. Now, the Nachash was a very interesting type of animal in the garden because the Nachash was, as it says, was Arum, chapter 3, verse 1. Arum meaning naked. He didn't, maybe didn't have fur. It seems to be that this Nachash was unique in the animal kingdom because it could stand on two legs, and it, it, could, it could talk to you and speak to you and, and, and discuss philosophy with you in a, in a very unique way. Look at that tree. Doesn't it engage you? Doesn't it just draw you in? Doesn't it just make you want to think about beautiful ideas? It's, 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 it's a, um, 
a very interesting type of of animal, of creature. Now, we have a tradition that says the Nachash was more than just an animal. That this Nachash was, in fact, the Satan, and the Satan was placed inside of this animal, as it were, that could walk and talk and can speak to us. Now, that's interesting in its own right, why Hashem chose to place the Satan in an animal, or in an animal that can address us. So first of all, we have to understand that, you know, we understand that the Satan is an angel of Hashem. Satan works for Hashem. Satan is one of Hashem's most, maybe most important angel, because his job is to intensify our free choice, and by intensifying our free choice, allow us to earn the reward God wants to give us forever. Nowhere do we say that the Nachash, is, that the Satan is evil. He's doing his job. In fact, we might even say that he's the only angel that's happy when, when we don't listen to him. He wants us to succeed because God wants us to succeed. But his job is to test us, and that he does very well. But God placed the Nachash, placed the Satan in this creature called the Nachash. And his job is to come up with the best test he can in order to convince Adam and Eve to eat of the tree. That's his job. That's what Hashem has commanded, instructed him to do. Now, just looking at the Pasuk, the word says, V'nachashai arum mikochai He was naked. It's interesting. And I look at a translation of arum. It says cunning. Interesting, naked. It really means, arum means naked. Yet it's also a word in the Hebrew language for cunning. Cunning meaning crafty, tricky, sneaky. Why does the word naked and cunning mean the same thing? I would have thought that they're two polar opposites. You know, sometimes in the English language we'll say, the naked truth, which I'm telling you the truth. I'm being extraordinarily honest. To be cunning seems to be the opposite of naked, the naked truth. Perhaps we could suggest that maybe this Nachash is going to offer an argument which has a very strong level of truth in it and in essence is being nakedly honest, but by being nakedly honest is also being extraordinarily cunning. Let's see if we could explore that and see what that means. So it says that the Nachash, he was the most cunning animals from all the animals of the field. I shall also Hashem Elokim, which God created. The Yomer. And he says a very interesting line. He says to Adam and Chava, he says to Chava, excuse me, to Chava, he goes to Chava, to Eve. Why to Chava, not to Adam? Because Adam was given the commandment, not Eve. And therefore he went to the weaker link, as it were. You know, his job is to, to convince them. He's doing his job well. Go to the weaker link. Go to the one who didn't hear it directly. Adam did hear it directly. Apparently his job was to have taught it well to Eve. So maybe we could say he didn't teach it well, or maybe Eve wasn't, didn't learn it or didn't uh, focus well enough. But in any case, the Nachash chooses well, and he goes to Eve. And what does he say to her? His opening salvo, his opening line, his opening attack is very interesting. Listen to the attack. He says... Even if God said, and he stops. Even if God said, don't eat from all the trees of the garden. Even if God said, don't eat from all the trees of the garden. And he stops. What's wrong with that sentence? First of all, it's a fragment. Even if God said, don't eat from all trees of the garden, comma, and he stops. Whenever you have an even, even if God said, don't eat from all the trees of the garden, you just can't end the sentence there. You have to fill it in with something else. That's a fragment. You need to end it. Apparently, he wanted Eve to fill in the sentence in her mind. Even if God said, don't eat from all the trees of the garden, Eve, you fill in the blank, who cares what God said? Apparently, it seems like that's what he was trying to, to uh, inspire in Eve's mind. Her to fill in the sentence where she would say, who cares what God said? 
The question on that is, is, is that a powerful opening attack? One would think that the Nachash would use his, his strongest argument. Is that the strongest argument he could use? I mean, we, we're in the Garden of Eden still. Eve was created by Hashem just a few hours before, according to the Gemara and Rosh Hashanah. She's intimately aware of the presence of the Almighty. Why would she want to do anything against that which Hashem wants? Why would she, in her mind, even think to think? Who cares what God says? Of course she cares what God says. She's aware of God, Hashem's enormity, His size, His power, His love, His, His, His creation, His gift of life to her. How could one betray Hashem when you're so aware of Hashem? What's the Nakash trying to do with an argument of, even if God said don't eat, well, Eve, you fill in the blank. Who cares what God said? That doesn't seem to be a powerful attack. I'd like to share with you an approach that Rav Shimshon Raphael Hirsch says. And I want to thank Rav David Foreman for, for really uh, highlighting this to me. Maybe what the Nachash is saying, and this is going to Rav Hirsch, is you have to read the verse a little bit differently. Let's read it with a different inflection. The Nachash turns to Eve and says, V'yomer le'isha, Af ki amar elokim. Even if God said, Lo toch lo mikol yitzagan, don't eat from all the trees of the garden. Even if God said, don't eat, why do you have to listen to what God said? Maybe Hashem communicates in another language. Well, what is that other language? Well, let me tell you, Eve. I'm from the animal kingdom. I'm a nachash. It's true I could walk and I could talk and I, I could engage you in dialogue. That's very true. But I, I want to describe, I want to ask you a question. I, as an animal, when I look at that tree, you know what happens to me? My eyes get drawn towards it because it, that fruit looks so luscious. I, I then begin to salivate. I think about it. And all of a sudden, I have a desire that my teeth just want to take a bite of it. And I just want to taste it. And I want to just feel it and, and be able just to enjoy it. Eve, let me ask you a question. What happens when you look at that tree? You know what you would say back? It's interesting. I feel the exact same thing. I'm looking. I'm so inspired by it. I'm so enticed by it. It, it just it's attracting my attention. It looks so lush, so delicious. I just want to take a bite of it and enjoy it. And, and, and then the snake turns to Eve and says, "Really? Wow! You and I have the same desires." Eve, let me ask you a question. That desire that you feel for the tree. The desire that you feel for that, that fruit, whatever it might be, four-way debate in the top of what it is, whatever that desire you feel for the tree, where did that desire come from? Did God create that desire? And of course, Eve would say back, yeah, of course God created that desire. He created every aspect of who I am. So Eve, let me ask you a question. Chava, let me ask you a question. If God created that desire, why do you want to withhold hold and resist a desire that God created in you? If God creates desire, isn't it holy? Isn't it kadosh? Isn't it supposed to be utilized because it's an expression, it's a, something Hashem gave you? It's Hashem planted inside of you. It's His gift to you. He's speaking to you through that desire that He wants you to enjoy the world through it. He wants you to have pleasure through it. It's, he planted that desire there. Eve, why do you want to control and resist that which Hashem planted inside of you? He's the creator of it. I'm an animal, and when I feel desire for something, Hashem wants me to go for it. He created that same desire in you. Maybe He wants you to listen to that language, that language that comes from within inside yourself. Even if God said, don't eat, 
why is God's word more important than the other way he speaks to you, which is through the desires of your body, desires of your hearts, of your heart? They're both God created, aren't they? Why is one more powerful than the other? Even if Afki Amr Elohim, even if God said don't eat, why is God's word the only thing you should listen to? Maybe you need to listen to the other part of your creation, the animal in you, which is also God's creation of you, your desires and your passions. Now, perhaps it sounds a little strange to us because we understand that, of course, the job of life is to have God's word rule the body. But maybe on the first day of creation, where there's an animal kingdom, and there's this completely new creation called the Adam, the human being, together with the animals, maybe there's need for differentiation. Where are you? What side of the fence do you belong on? What's your relationship to the animal kingdom? Are you a completely different being? Or are you, in some ways, similar? Because you do share something in common. Define yourself. What's the true holiness of who you are? Is it God's word that comes through the mind? Or God's word that comes through the body? Now, you know, when I say it might sound a little bit simplistic in, in, in some ways, but the reality, the message that's being communicated, I think is extraordinarily sophisticated, that that is the fight that we all face. The challenge of life is always God's word versus me. God's word versus my body, my passions, my lusts, my desires, my wants, my selfishness, my, 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 my insecurities and fears because, you know, I'm, I'm in, the body's naturally afraid and, and the mind knows God's there. That battle between the mind and the body is the, is the challenge of a human being, every human being. And so right now, the snake is addressing Chava and saying, well, who is the real you? Is it God speaking through your mind with a command? Or is that holiness of your body, which is your passion, desire, God's creation, maybe that's what you're supposed to be listening to. Define yourself. They're both holy, aren't they? Of course, we understand that the holiness of the body is, is a function of when we direct it through the mind, but they are both inherently holy. You know, I just, I, I was told once Rabbi Foreman mentioned this, and I think it's worth sharing, that a, a late night uh, radiocaster was once interviewing a, a, a boy who, a young teenager, who had chosen celibacy before marriage. And this interviewer was giving me a tough time and asking him a question and saying to him, let me see a question, you've, you've chosen celibacy before marriage, and so there's a kid who was a, so a, so a religious person in his own right, and he said, yes. And he said, um, let me ask you a question, are you, are you attracted to the opposite gender? And he said, yeah, well, of course I'm attracted. And he said, let me ask you a question, um, do you believe in God? He goes, of course I, I believe in God, that's the, my motivation for what I'm, I'm doing. He goes, let me ask you one more question. Who created the attraction? Didn't God create the attraction? If God created the attraction, why do you want to limit and withhold and resist that which God created? God created it. If God created it, isn't it holy? So why aren't you going for it? Why aren't you pursuing it? Why aren't you following it? And apparently this teenager couldn't really answer that. But when we think about the question, whose question was that? That was the question of the Nachash. That was the snake. God created desires and passions. Why don't you follow them? They're his creation. Why is God's word more important? They're also natural desire. We see how easily one could fall into that trap because our desires and passions do possess us and are so much a part of us. And differentiating between that part of ourselves and God's word and separating the two so God's word rules over them is one of the challenges of life. And one can almost hear that argument in one's head. Well, if God created the desire, well, you know, why, why resist it? Why control it? We have to understand a higher level vision of life that Kedusha comes through channeling it and utilizing it properly. 
But on day one of creation, not a bad test for the first man and woman, for the first woman in this case. Who are you? Are you totally separate from the animal kingdom? Or since you share common qualities, maybe you're supposed to act on those qualities because these two are God created. And we know, of course, he fails the test. And she does eat. Now, just two points I want to make on this. Number one, it's interesting that before Eve is created, so we know that God creates Adam, and he says that famous line, Lo tov Adam levado es lo a konegdo, it's not good for a man to be alone. We're going to create for him an Ezer Konegdo, a helpmate who's in opposition. Rashi tells us, if he's Zocher, she'll be an Ezer. If he's Lo Zocher, Konegdo. Say if a person, if a man follows the word of Hashem, she'll assist him and help him. If a man resists Hashem, she'll be in opposition. A woman is a spiritual compass. And then, after saying, let's create an Ezer Konegdo, Hashem commands Adam to go out and name the animals. What does Hashem say? It says, Hashem says, Adam liros Hashem presents to him all the chayas asadeh, the kolo of the, the animals, the birds. He brings it to Adam to see what, you'll, what, what will you name them? Apparently the names of the animals were Adam's invention. And the name which Adam will give that will be his name. You know, just for example, I'd like to use this example, which could be true, but I think it might be true. Adam looked at the elephant and called the elephant a peel, peyud lamed. So it's interesting. Why did he call the elephant a peel? Well, the letter pe means mouth. The letter yad, the letter yud means yad, a hand. Interesting. Where's the hand of the elephant? It's on its mouth. And the letter Lamed means Lamed, which means teach. Interesting, you know, that trunk of the elephant, that hand of the elephant, which is on his mouth, is an extraordinary organ. It can pick up trees. In some countries, they actually use them almost like tractors. At the same time, it's so refined and, and so delicate that it can extract a seed from a nut. It's like a laparoscopic instrument in an operating room, and at the same time being a caterpillar tractor. <laughs> you know, we human beings, we can create tractors and we can create laparoscopic instruments, for la- but we have never created a tractor which also has the capacity to, di- to dissect seeds from nuts. That we can't do. But you look at that trunk of the elephant, it has two opposite qualities strength and detail in one, strength and exactitude in one. That's only something God could create. So interesting. Adam looks at the elephant and says, your appeal, pay your lamed. The hand on your mouth teaches. What does it teach? It teaches the glory of Hashem. It teaches how great Hashem is. Only Hashem could create such a wondrous organ. That's the trunk of the elephant. That's appeal. But in any case, Adam is tasked to name the animals before Eve is created. And our sages say something very interesting, that he was really told to go out to the animals and really look at them, really examine them deeply, see what his relationship to them is. So perhaps we might suggest that Hashem in his infinite kindness, he knew what he was asking of the snake. He was asking the snake to really test them. Test them to say, who are you? Are you an animal who has desires and passions? And of course, God's word is part of it. Or are you something totally different than the animal kingdom where God's word is to completely control the animal in you? As God knows the test that he's asked the snake to perform, maybe he's giving Adam this assignment before creating Eve so that Adam should have an intimate awareness of how different he is from the animal kingdom. So that when this test comes down the pike, they'll be alerted, he'll be ready for it. He'll be able to to say, 
You can't fool me with this one. I have nothing in common with the animal kingdom. But the snake was tricky. <laughs> the snake went to Chava. Maybe Chava didn't get the message as clearly. Now it's also interesting to make a comment. At the end of the story, what happens? So Hashem speaks to Adam, and he asks Adam a question, and he says to Adam, he said, why did you do it? And Adam, in that enormous lack of gratitude to Hashem for creating Eve, says, Aisha, the, the woman, that you gave to stand beside me, she gave it to me, and I ate. And God turns to Eve and says, why did you do it? And he says, Anachashishiyani, the snake seduced me. Then Hashem turns to the Nachash, and he says to the Nachash, he doesn't ask the Nachash a question. What does he say to the Nachash? In chapter 3, verse 14, Hashem turns to the Nachash and says, V'yom Hashem elokim ala Nachash, ki asis azos, because you did this. Hakmi doesn't ask why he did it, like he asked Adam and Chava. The answer is because he knows why he did it. I told you to do it. But then Hashem says, You're going to be cursed from all the animals. You're going to crawl on your stomach now. No more legs. And eat dust the rest of your life. And I'm going to create hatred between you and, and mankind. They're going to want to stamp on your head and you're going to try to bite their heel. There's going to be an enmity between you and the man, and you, you and mankind now. Now, question. As we see, God doesn't ask the Nachash why he did it. He knows why he did it. Because he programmed, he told him to. If, he, if that's so, why does he seemingly punish him at the end of the story? He merely did that which Hashem asked of him. You know, why? So Rav Hirsch offers something very interesting. Rav Hirsch says, once again, who says it's a punishment? How can you punish an angel? Remember, he's the Satan in this body, in this Nachash. An angel can only do the will of God. An angel can't disobey God. So how can he punish him for doing what he was supposed to have done? True, he did his job well, but that's what he was told to do. So I've heard suggest and says, maybe it's not a punishment. Who says it's a punishment? It's a consequence. But the consequence isn't for the Nachash, isn't for the snake. It's for mankind. We should understand something. That argument that the snake used that says there is no difference between the human being and the animal. That argument is baseless. That argument has no legs to stand on. No longer can you walk on two legs and crawl on your stomach. It's a baseless argument. Never think that's true. We're entirely different than the animal kingdom. We're controlled by God's word, not by the animal inside of us. We rule the animal inside of us. We stand on all. We stand upright. The head has to be above the heart, and head and heart above loins. Animals walk on all fours. Head, heart, passion, only instinct. We God's word has to be what controls us. Gemara Nida says that the baby in the womb holds its head. Why? Because in the womb it's connected to Shemaim and understands the source of my connection is my mind because that's where God's word flows. That has to direct me. And now what happens? The snake is going to be despised by mankind. That same snake which was almost like a friend that could talk to you and address you and say, join me in the animal kingdom, be like me. That snake becomes a reptile which is the polar opposite of a human being. You know, the, the reptile kingdom is, is the most unhuman-like type of animal out there. You know, when we go to the zoo, we like going to the gorilla cage. Why? Because they're so human-like. They seem to hold their children in similar ways and, 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 and walk with them. And there's certain enjoyment looking at an animal that does things very much like the human being. Of course, they don't have what we have. But the enjoyment of going to the reptile cage is there's a strangeness in it. They're so unhuman-like. And therefore, they've always been a symbol throughout history of, 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 of being unhuman. You know, modern tales also, you know, this idea that the, the snake is always, like Voldemort likes the snake, you know, if Harry Potter fans out there. You know, it, it's, it's whenever we're talking about a being that's unhuman, he relates to the snake. Hashem turns this same creature and said, join me in the animal kingdom. 
into a creature now which says, I'm so different from you. So we should never again make that error to think that the real me is the animal. The real I is God's word. And that's as we have to live our lives, and that's we direct our lives. I think that's a little bit of the wisdom that we, we gain from just a, a little a view of this story. And God willing, going forward now, the next number of weeks, we hope to explore together a few more of the stories in, in the book of Rashis, and Rosh Hashem find the depth of the meaning that help us to live our lives with more color and more verve and more meaning and more beauty. Wish everybody a wonderful week. Thank you so much for listening.